All right, good morning, everyone. We're thankful for this opportunity that we can share with you. We trust that you are well where you're at. And this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bible to Psalm 91. Psalm chapter 91. I know this is very un unusual times, difficult times for many during the COVID-19, as well as what's happened across our nation. We pray that God will continue to manifest His grace, His mercy towards each of you. We do pray that God will encourage you today. This is a day that the Lord has made and we can rejoice and we can be glad in it. So with that in mind, would you join me in a word of prayer? I want to thank you for uh, chiming in this Sunday morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you for all that you do for us each and every day. And I pray the Holy Spirit of God um, will take the truth of your word and use it to further your will. I would ask that you would be with everyone and their needs, whether it be health, whether it be relationships. Lord, we pray for your provision to be met in their lives. We ask that you continue to be with the leaders of our land, guide them in their decision, help those that are in bereavement today, and we'll give you thanks and praise for what you do. Speak to our hearts now through the truth of your word. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I've been doing some research, probably like some of you, in, in terms of COVID-19. Where is, is there any country, is there any place in our world that is COVID-free 19? And surprisingly, there are some places that have not reported a COVID-19 case. And one of them is familiar to our church family, a little country called Tuvalu, uh, where we have a missionary there that's by the name of Charlie Lawson and their family. And other countries around the world have not reported any COVID cases. Now, I'm not sure if that means there are any there, but as far as I know, there are some, not a whole lot. And I'm sure you're concerned about your plans and the things that you'll be doing this upcoming uh, summer as far as your family and uh, the things that you might want to consider. In Cibola County, in the state of New Mexico, we have some liberties and again, some restrictions. And our hearts go out to those of you that have loved ones that have, are dealing with health issues. And uh, we pray that God would encourage you and comfort you. In Psalm 91, we have a tremendous psalm. It is a psalm perhaps written by Moses. There's no title as to given to who's the author of this psalm. But the doctors of the Hebrew law say that when a psalm is not given, usually it's been written by the one preceding that psalm. We looked at Psalm chapter 90 in our last study of the book of Psalms. And today on this Sunday morning, we're asking God to use his precious word. I've entitled our devotion this morning, our message, The Best Place to Be. Maybe you have some experiences about your life and where you've gone, and you've said something like this, if only I could live here. Maybe you've traveled around the world, maybe you were in some sort of business, or maybe you were in the military, uh, like myself, you got a chance to see different parts of the world. And... There are different blessings and challenges with every geographical area. But in Psalm 91, I believe the Lord gives us a clear answer. The best place to be is not a geographical place, but rather it's a spiritual place. Let me read in Psalm 91 verse 1. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of of the Almighty. Interesting passage. 57 times the word Almighty is used. The first time it's used is used in Genesis 17, verse 1, when God spoke to Abraham at 99 years of age, Abraham was, and said, The Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty. Walk before me. And this is a tremendous reminder that God takes note of both young and old and everybody in between. But where is the best place to live anyway? Where is the best place to be? Psalm chapter 91, verse 9 has the answer. Because thou hast made the Lord, 
which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. You see in verse 1 and in verse 9, there's a reference to dwelling, a place of living, a place of habitation, a place to be. Some would speculate that it was the temple dwelling. Some would speculate it was the earthly temple. That's where God dwells. Some people think a church building is where God is at. Let me read this for you in Acts chapter 17 and verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Did you get that? God is not restricted to what man can do, but God, the almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, is a person. And this person wants you to reside, live in his presence, dwell in him and make your Make him your habitation. Make him your dwelling place. Because there are various reasons that Psalm 91 give us. And we're going to try to address that this morning. The best place to be is in a relationship with the Lord God Almighty. And that would include his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So let's look at Psalm 91. First of all, I believe that to make God your habitation, to make God your dwelling place, to make God the place where you live in is very important. And faith is a choice. The Bible says, He that dwelleth, that's a choice, in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the mighty. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. He uses two words here, refuge and fortress. So here's my first thought here from Psalm 91. The Lord is the best place to live with, live in, dwell with, because he is a safe place. He provides a safe place, a place of protection a protection in your life. Keep in mind it's not geographical, but it's a relationship, a spiritual relationship. And the Lord gives us insight here. He goes on to say in verse 3, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. The snare representing a trap. The fowler will be the hunter. Now spiritually, there is one who hates our guts. You say, who could that be? Satan, the devil, our adversary. According to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour, or that is destroy, make ineffective. So if you are in a right relationship with God, if God is your habitation, he can help you to live a life where Satan doesn't get the victory in your life. 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, says this, there hath no temptation or testing such as common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. There are far too many people that are looking for excuse to do whatever they want to do, including sinning against God, instead of trusting in God and looking for the way of escape. God is our protector. God is our refuge. He is described as a habitation that you can live with and live in. Verse number four, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So this is a biggie right here. And what I mean by that, how does God primarily protect you as a child of God? Through the truth of his word. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. 
There have been critics and attacks upon the precious Word of God, the Bible, and I would encourage you to get one. Begin to get familiar with the truths, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and understand that you can, by the grace of God, as you become a recipient of God's Spirit through salvation, understand what the Bible has to say. But here, the Lord gives us a true that you can live by, you can hang your head on, and that is His truth can protect you from wrongdoing. You know, the greatest enemy of the Christian life, according to the Bible, are these. Satan, the world system, and the flesh. I find that in my life, my greatest enemy, I can blame the devil, I can blame what people do, but I'm my greatest enemy because I live in a mortal body. According to Romans chapter number 7, you can read about it, Paul the Apostle describes this flesh and its propensity and its bent on doing its own thing. And so he writes further on that we must die to self. Jesus said that if this, if any man will come unto me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Truth will set you free. That is the truth of God's word. Sanctify them, set them apart. God has a way of not only cleansing us through his word, but renewing our thinking and giving us the wherewithal, the grace to say no to what is evil. Psalm 119 reminds us, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. And there are some things that the world's going to try to get you to do. Uh, think of what's taking place in our country even right now. There are two things that are highlighted in this time. The concern and health of many, and because some people have been infected by the virus, some people have passed on, and our condolences go to all those families. But in the last week, we've been reminded of the sinfulness of mankind. There's nobody perfect. The Bible reminds us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. But I can as a Christian, and you can as a child of God, get familiar with the truth of Scripture and hide the Word of God and let the truth of God guide you and help you make right decisions. For example, is it right to steal? What does the Bible have to say? Is it right to lie? What does the Bible have to say? Is it right to cheat on your husband or your wife? What does the Bible have to say? You see, God has a lot to say through his word about everyday living. How about obeying authorities? What does the Bible have to say? Uh, how about standing for your faith and sharing the gospel? You know, during this COVID restriction, uh, churches are challenged just like anybody else. Christians are challenged. But Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And so I have learned in my Christian life that the word of God is, a, is our shield. He uses an analogy. We know what a shield is. We've seen plexiglasses at the post office, perhaps. We have seen certain walls put up during the Bible days. A shield was a, was a protecting device. And then he also mentions here uh, that his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. A buckler would be a smaller kind of a shield, about the size of a frying pan. Would protect uh, those from darts and, and arrows and so forth. Well, Satan has a lot of arsenal. And he can throw a lot at you. Let me just address one. Satan wants you to live in fear. What does God want you to live in? God wants you to live in his ability, his power, his might, his peace. Which brings me to my second point. Not only does God provide us protection, but God provides for us security. You like that word? I do. Well, if you have car insurance, you have insurance to hopefully have a peace of mind in case you have an automobile wreck of some sort, a fender bender, you can get that vehicle taken care of. Well, listen to what the Bible says. 
because you make the Lord your habitation, because he is now your refuge, you made him your fortress. Now God can begin to work with your choices. And here's one of the results of you depending on God, trusting in him. The Bible says in verse number five, he, thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that fly by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. Thousands shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is the, my, habit, my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. Security, the idea of comfort. The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, a lot of people have been tried and tested during this coronavirus on many fronts from everyone working different hours and extend, extension of work. And as pastors, preachers, and teachers, we are never, uh, let's say we're on call all the time. So we're constantly, uh, you know, if we have something we can try to, try to minister on behalf of you, we certainly want to try to do that. But I've been thinking about how many people have been concerned about their immunity because they've been sick, they've been working long hours. And the Lord has a way of giving us grace. Here in Psalm 91 again, he says, thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. As a matter of fact, if we could compile all the not be afraid in the Bible, someone said there's a not be afraid for every day of our lives throughout this year, 2020. That was one of the messages Jesus spoke. Do not be afraid or fear not. In other words, don't worry. And so you can choose to be afraid or you can choose to make the Lord your habitation. And one of the blessings of knowing him and knowing his comfort and knowing his truth is that fear has a way of not being in the driver's seat. Someone said, it's okay to let fear visit with you. Don't let him reside there. And that's the point here. And the psalmist is reminding us that you know, the world is not a safe place. Have you figured that out? So when I, this world is dangerous. No one leaves, leaves it, uh, leaves, uh, leaves the earth alive unless the rapture happens, the taking up of the saints. But fear has been known to grip man from operating their life. The Bible has a lot to say about the subject of fear. Here's one passage the Apostle Paul gave to us. God had not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And that could, the fears that we face could be maybe directly related to what we're watching on TV, what we're reading, what we're seeing on our phone. You know, as Christians, we are commanded by God to rejoice in the Lord always. And, and you know, you can live in fear or you can have a different outlook on life. And I, I'm not saying don't, we don't ignore what's taking place. But what goes through the eye gate and ear gate affects the heart. So our focus can be different. And the focus that we have here is God sees it all. And uh, choose you, Joshua said, this day whom you will serve and who you will yield to, who you will give your life to. That's the point here. There are many people in our society and our world that think they can handle everything and anything all on their own come to find out that even the most well-built of fortresses that mankind has come up with, I'm talking about in the United States, I'm talking about ex very expensive places to live, even those people at this hour have been impacted by coronavirus, things along this line. But I'm talking about security, comfort. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the blessing of making the Lord your habitation, your dwelling place, the place where you will be, because faith is a choice, is not only a safety, 
a safety net, if you please, a protection from sin and evil. And I'm talking about you making choices. I can't always control what people do, but I can control what I do, and you can control what you do, but security, having comfort. You can bite your nails all night, and you can walk the floor all night. You can stay up awake all night, or you can rest in the loving, almighty care for your life. Here's the third thing. In verse 10 and following, we find that the Lord works in the supernatural. You know, God is not dead. He's alive. Amen? He's a, he's a blessed Savior and Lord, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing, too hard for God to do. You and I are limited to, to, to time, but God is not. The Bible tells us concerning our God, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adler, and the young lion and the, young, the dragon shalt thou trample under feet, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him, and I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. When we think about what the Bible says here in Psalm 91, the psalmist mentions angels. You say, do I believe in angels? I sure do. But you got to remember, there, are, there were fallen angels that fell from heaven. So there's a lot of fallen angels that are living, living, leading people astray and to even worship those angels. That's not the angels I'm talking about. I'm talking about a supernatural power that the Lord allows us in life. He calls them ministering spirits. The Bible says concerning angels in Psalm 103, verse 20, Bless the Lord. Ye angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. You know, the angels that I'm talking about are those that are in agreement, are those that follow and obey the teachings of the word of God, that follow the commands of God. The Bible teaches us that the angel of the Lord encamp it round about them that fear him, you know, when we look back at the Old Testament, I'm going to share with you a true account. In 2 Kings chapter number 19, we have the account of Hezekiah, whom the people of God were being threatened by Sennacherib, the Syrian army. You can read all about it. And uh, Hezekiah gave that letter to the religious leaders or the spiritual group, and they basically took that letter and and shared that letter before God, and spread their need before God, and that's a great thing to do. If you're feeling overwhelmed with some of the things you're dealing with, I could not think of a better thing to do, like going to God in prayer. Amen? So, in this case, in, in 2 Kings chapter number 19, Hezekiah takes the letter of the hand, written, hand written by Sennacherib, and he spreads it before the Lord. He cast his burden before God. And what does God do? God comes miraculously, supernaturally, and he takes care of the enemy. God has been known to do other things with his angels. For example, at the birth of Jesus, the angel Gabriel announced to um, Zacharias and, and that great, uh, you can read about it, news that the Savior would one day be born. Uh, think about the angels at the tomb uh, of Jesus. Christ was crucified and uh, died for the sins of mankind, was buried and rose again, and they laid his body prior to that. I mean, three days after his death, the angels came and said, Whom seek ye? Uh, and then the they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And the angel said, He is not here. For he is risen as he said. We find in the New Testament, all throughout the New Testament, occasions that remind us that God is working supernaturally. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that God still can work in the lives of people through ministering spirits we call angels. But lastly, because you've made God your habitation, you can experience 
not only safety of the Lord, that is protection. You can experience, I would say, to some degree, this idea of comfort, and or you can be stressed out. You can ex- you can see the supernatural power of God unleashed, and and I would say when you abide in Him and He abides in you, you can take advantage of this thing we call prayer. And Paul said, "Now unto Him who is able to do exceedingly." And abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Some people think that you have to be super spiritual to have your prayers answered. That's not true. We all are what we are by the grace of God. Amen? And uh, listen, God is still hearing and answering prayer. But here's the last thing I want to point out. And that is that of salvation. You can make God your invitation because He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the one that's able to save unto the uttermost. The Bible tells us in verse 15, He should call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. The word salvation means to be delivered from. Oftentimes in life, we find ourselves perhaps in a tight corner, in a tight spot, if you please. Maybe it's in your relationships. Maybe it's in your finances. Maybe it could be in your health. There's all sorts of things we encounter all throughout our days. Here's some thoughts that I I wanna rehearse and just remind you that life is full of trouble sometimes. And Job says, from the day that someone is born, sparks fly upward, meaning there's adversity that's going to come. And this world is not my home. As one songwriter said, I'm just passing through. But what, what can I do if I make God my refuge? Again, he says, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. Now, I just want to park there for a moment. Sometimes, even in the most difficult things we face, let's say a thunderstorm. I remember uh, having our five kids in our home, and, and sometimes when there was a bad thunderstorm, they would run into the bedroom wherever their mom was or wherever she was, and they would cling to her or cling to their dad. You know, the idea that there was security. You know, God is greater than all our troubles, and God has promised us never to leave us, never to forsake us. And the psalmist said, even when I go to the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23, thou art with me. Hebrews 13 and verse 5 says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Now you might be feeling, well, I feel forsaken. I feel like I'm all alone. I understand that to some degree. But friend, I'm here to tell you, you can only live so much on the circumstances of life. We believe the Bible by faith. We believe that God has written to us a love letter. God, God's only one written one love letter, and that is the Bible. So become, become familiar with the truth of what God has promised us, because he will not leave you, friend. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, according to Ephesians chapter number 1, and uh, sealed unto the day of redemption. But let me mention in verse 16... With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, is it possible to live a long life but not a fulfilling life? It's very possible. That is, have no direction, just simply existing. But I would say the kind of life all of us want to live is a life that has some sort of meaning. Amen? And think about this, that you can live the rest of your days from this day forth. Knowing the Lord is your Savior, knowing Him as your, your, your God. Throughout the Bible, we find occasions of people making reference to my God. I think about Thomas, who did not see the Lord. And there are many today that would not put their faith and trust in Jesus because they say something like, how do you know He's alive? How do you know He existed? Thomas was one who had a lot of doubt. And then he saw Jesus, the resurrected Lord, and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Blessed are those 
that have not seen and have yet believed. Faith is a choice. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now the word salvation here means to be delivered from. We're not all, we may live a short life, I'm talking about year span, or you may live a long life, three score years and 10, 70, or four score years, 80, and some more or less. But one of these days, as I know life, and according to the Bible, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Now what comes next? This is why this truth is important. Salvation. God had promised salvation through his only son, born of a virgin who loves you and willingly gave his life for you and me. And Jesus himself was crucified on Calvary's cross along with two thieves there. And the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There are many people that have said, how do I know that God loves me? By faith, we can look to Calvary. We love him because he first, what? Loved us. Romans 5, a verse 8 says, But God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And when you recognize that he is the Savior, and usually that can begin when you acknowledge that, first of all, You've sinned against God. There's no one perfect. And that Christ laid down his life. Do I believe it? Do I believe that he was crucified on my behalf? I believe it. Was he buried? And then he rise on the third day. Do you believe that? In Romans chapter number 10, verse 9, the apostle Paul wrote, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, there, God, that, that there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friend, trust in and God's only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the key to knowing all these blessings. You cannot make the Lord God, your habitation, apart from knowing Jesus as your Savior. In Acts 4.12, we're reminded, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So, today is another opportunity. This Sunday, this day is your day to decide to choose to follow and to put your faith in trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation, the idea of being delivered from. As I mentioned, one day our time will come. It's appointed unto man once to die. I pray it doesn't happen to you today, but we have not a promise of another 24 hours. What's going to happen when you die? Well, there's some good news, friend. The God of heaven made a way for us to be delivered from. Delivered from the penalty of sin. Delivered one day from the presence of sin to be able to be in his eternal presence we call heaven. And so if you've never trusted in Jesus today, the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of thy salvation. And in this verse, we find a, pass, a word that we spoke on recently. It says, with long life will I satisfy him. The Lord is the only one that can satisfy the want to, the longing in your heart. When you make the Lord your habitation, your dwelling place, no matter where you go then, you take, in a sense, God with you, because he has said he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Our time here on earth is but a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. While you're here on this earth, I would pray and I will hope that you will make the God of heaven, all God Almighty, your habitation, your dwelling place. 
And how can you do that? Trust in his only son, born of a virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, and one day died for you, died for all the world, was buried and rose on the third day. He's a living Savior. He's a living Lord. And then, as a result of that, you can experience the safety of God for your life. You can experience, as we have looked today, how God can give spiritual victories, even working in the supernatural. Man's only limited, but God is not. He can hear and answer prayer. He can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And he can provide salvation, the saving of a soul. And friend, I couldn't think of a better thing to do than to make God your habitation than to do so today. Would you do that? And if you do, friend, I'm here to tell you, you'll experience forgiveness of sins. God will grant uh, eternal life to you. And the Bible tells us that he can change your heart. And the Bible tells us that the Lord has given us precious promises that you can begin to live by. And so with that, I want to thank you for allowing me to share this moment. And I trust the Lord will keep you continually safe. What is the best place to be? Where is the best place to be? Is it in our country, another country? Is it in this vacation spot, that vacation spot? If God allows you vacation this summer, I pray that God will keep you safe. But the best place to be is an intimate relationship with God Almighty, and that involves His Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father that is comes to the Almighty, but by me. So would you today trust in Him, and experience all that God has for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for your goodness. I pray that you'll help our church family. I pray you encourage them. I pray you be with everyone listening today, whatever needs they have. I pray you'll take the truth of this message and help them. Dear God, to look to you and to search with, for you with all their heart while there is a real spiritual enemy we know as the devil who wants to distort who wants to confuse who doesn't want people to come to the knowledge of the truth i pray today someone's heart will be challenged to seek you with all their heart the lord will give you thanks and will give you praise for what you do in jesus precious name we do pray amen